So this, this next talk is going to be what I learned about security at Burning Man, and it's Lisa. Lorenzen. Lorenzen. So right on. Lisa. Thanks. So who here has been to Burning Man? I've been to Burning Man. All right, so you guys can sleep through the next five minutes because you already know the first, you know, four things I'm going to say. So for those of you who haven't been to Burning Man, it's a big fucking hippie fire festival in the Nevada desert. You've got artists, you've got makers, you've got druggies, you've got people who like sun. Basically, we all get out there and party like hell. Wear sunscreen. Wear sunscreen. Drink a lot of water. Do not make friends with the medics. Um, yes, and when I say a big party, 50,000 people. This is the biggest port john installation in the world. I'm told that it's the sixth biggest city in Nevada by the weekend when the man burns. So we're all out there, and you can't really tell anything from this picture, but there's people out there in tents, there's people out there in RVs, there's people out there like me in geodesic domes wrapped with mylarized bubble wrap because, baby, that's warm at night and cold during the day, and that's what you want. We have, as far as I know, the only two-story dome on the playa. We built our dome high enough that we could suspend a second story from the geodesic nodes. We've got swamp coolers. So if you're at Burning Man and you want somewhere cool to hang out during the day, cult of levitating plywood, say you met me at ShmooCon, they'll give you a drink. So what do people do? Why do people go out there? This is the best reason I can come up with. This, everything there is incredible. You have people building things with fire. You have three semi-trucks bent into an S-curve and welded together 40 feet high in the desert. You have more costumes and creativity and art, music. Oh my god. You're out there at night, and you've actually you're out there in the morning because you've been up all night. And you lie down because you're going to pass out if you don't get two hours of sleep. And there's in the background, unst, 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 unst. And it's because they have, at the far ends of this semicircle, they have truck, semi-truck sized generators running a rave non-stop for 10 days. <laughs> Transportation is a little interesting. You can drive your car in and then you park it for the week. So the only things that are allowed to drive around at Burning Man are mutant vehicles. The Division of Mutant Vehicles, the DMV, gives you an operating permit and that can be anything from the party bus. And the party bus is one of those two-piece with the hydraulic center and it's got fake fur all over it, and they put a platform on the top, and there's a woman pole dancing, or maybe a man pole dancing, you can't really tell, on the top. And the music is loud enough to make your ears bleed, and someone is handing out drinks with God knows what in them. And you've got everything from that to approximately a million and three people on bicycles. Because bicycles are the way to get around out there. Did I mention that we're in the desert? It's actually a dry lake bed. So what you've got is thousands of years of sediment at the bottom of a lake bed that has dried up and turned into the finest alkaline dust you will ever imagine. It gets in everything. You will be cleaning it out of your ears for a month afterwards. We'll get to that in a minute. So when you go out to Burning Man, you're either a citizen or a tourist. And you can tell them apart pretty easily because the tourist is the guy walking around in cargo shorts and a t-shirt and a ball cap with a beer ogling all the topless women, and the citizens look like this. And I, I could have put 15 pictures in here. I, the, the, the variety of human expression, the motto of Burning Man is self -reliance, radical self-reliance and radical self-expression. And you get this, you get everything. So what did I learn about security at Burning Man? Well, first of all, I learned that there's approximately a million ways that you can hurt yourself, and most of them start off by being a dumbass. And I think this applies directly to the information security community. So anytime you have an infographic about the myriad ways you're going to get hurt in an event, that tells you something going in. First of all, like most of us in InfoSec, we spend a lot of time in the dark literally in this case instead of figuratively. And imagine that you are driving a mutant vehicle through the desert at night under a partial or new moon. The only landmarks you have are 
the ring of lights around the edge and this ginormous frigging flaming lizard thing in the middle and whatever else is on fire near it. And you run across these two people. What are you going to do? You're probably not going to run them over with your mutant vehicle. On the other hand, if you run across these two people, <laughs> so security starts off with protecting yourself, figuring out what you need to do to avoid the obvious hazards. And when it's not other people trying to kill you, it's mother nature. So this to me represents the ambient noise level on the internet. We run our own mail and web server. We have SSH and a web server running. The amount of crap that I see in my firewall logs, I mean, I think that there are scripts out there that have been running unattended since 1993. So you have to know that every so often, when you're in the desert, Mother Nature is going to belch, basically. And so you get something like this, which is really pretty and makes an awesome photo from afar. But this is what it looks like when you're standing in it. That guy's playing mini golf. He's tougher than I am. So you have to know that you can get basically engulfed in a shitstorm at any moment. And having a plan for what to do about it is kind of helpful. So every year, they have a ride called Critical Tits. And they get as many topless women as they can to get on bikes and ride this circuitous route through the burn, out to the man, and then there's a party. And for the five years now that I've been going, every time Critical Tits is late in the week, and these dust storms are caused by, guess what? Us. Driving, walking, biking, tearing up the playa, that nicely packed, fine alkaline talcum powder, not so nice when the wind comes up and it's all in the air. So when I'm out, you know, a half mile from my camp and it looks like this, I'm going to be a lot happier if I have goggles and a dust mask and a compass and a friend. So two lessons from that. Number one, we bring a lot of this on ourselves. And number two, sometimes you can't avoid it, but you can sure as heck know the best way to ride it out. Another problem I see a lot in information security is people solving the wrong problem. So you'll notice. It's a little hard to see, but down in the bottom corner of this picture, what you're seeing, that lumpy thing, is a piece of rebar with a water bottle on top. So these guys are being really smart about their tent, because when the wind comes up out there, anything that's not nailed down is a tumbleweed. I mean, we've seen tents going ass over tea kettle. So you use the rebar to anchor it into the desert, and then you use the, the water bottle or the tennis ball or the stuffed animal to make sure that you don't cut somebody's shin off in the middle of the night when they get up to pee. The problem is, if your tent is not capable of withstanding the wind that it's nailed down against, you end up with this. I'm not sure where this guy spent the rest of the burn, but I'm guessing it wasn't in that tent. So in a lot of cases, you find that the controls you put in in one place end up causing you problems in others. <clears throat> User circumvention, anybody? The other nice thing about Mother Nature is she doesn't just whip up the dust in you know, relatively handleable circumstances. There's nothing like being at a huge something set on fire and watching the fire tornadoes go spinning out and people playing dodge them with the fire tornadoes. You haven't lived until you've seen a 60 foot high of swirling dust and flames coming straight at you. And as if that wasn't enough, a lot of people like pain, apparently. This is an event called Dance Dance Immolation at Burning Man. And the way that dance dance immolation works is you have a DDR pad, you have a Nomex suit, and a full respiratory system, and you have a face, a, a flamethrower mounted, pointed at your face. And you get on the DDR pad and you start doing your thing, and when you screw up, the flamethrower goes off. <laughs> and the fun part is that if you're really good and the DJ gets bored, he starts firing off the flamethrower at random intervals because he wants you to get off and let the next guy play. So some people go looking for trouble. You put an unpatched Windows 2000 or Windows XP system on the internet, this is what you're going to get. So why do I go? Because despite the fact that we have to fly across the country, truck in a ton and a half of water, pee in the port of johns for a week, and by Saturday, oh my god, stay up until dawn, live in the dust, at the end of the day, when you've got 50,000 people howling in unison as the man falls into, into the flaming base of the burn, 
it's worth it. I think of that as a metaphor for my job in information security. Some days, it doesn't feel like it's worth queuing through the straps, but some days there are 50,000 people howling in unison, chasing the same bug or the same issue or just the same cool thing that happened, and I realize, you know, these are my people. That's it. <laughs>